Quando da ragazzo alle scuole medie si studiava scienze, c'era un libro che si chiamava Osserva, sperimenta e impara. Stan prima ci ha parlato un po' della, di un aspetto della sua storia e di alcune sue esperienze. Ora ci parla in questo seminario con eh, diapositive del profondo viaggio all'interno della coscienza e le matrici e le strutture e il processo che ha appunto osservato, sperimentato e imparato. Quindi siamo onorati di ascoltarlo. Avrà una durata di quasi due ore, quindi avremo modo di entrare un po' nel mondo dell'esperienza di, di Stan. Some complaints about not hearing. Can you hear in the back? Is that better now? Okay. Um, I have a sense of kind of incomplete gestalt about the first part. So I would like to tell you, the, this is described in a very comprehensive way in the book Psychology of the Future. And also I would like to take you, uh, tell you about my website, which is my full name, stanislavgrov.com where there are a lot of papers that you can download, there's interviews, there is a link to the ITA website, the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, which is like a pictorial history of the transpersonal movement, pictures from the previous international transpersonal conferences. So those are all things that you can just do on your, on your own. Um, and I apologize that I was not disciplined enough to get it into the time that was allotted. Uh, now, as you heard, this what um, what we'll see now will will move to a completely different mode. Uh, many people who have these holotropic experiences, they say it's ineffable. I cannot really describe what happened to me, and we can do a little better with the right hemisphere, with paintings. So, what we'll see now is images that people um, created when they had experiences from the levels of the psyche that current psychiatry does not acknowledge, or if it acknowledges, it pathologizes it. You see, what I will be showing you, in my opinion, is the psyche per se, only psyche infinitely larger than the one that's described in the academy, or academia. So we will, uh, we will see uh, people going through the stages of birth, um, when you regress to birth, uh, the experiences would come in f four experiential clusters, and I call them basic perinatal matrices. So this is BPM. Uh, and on the one hand, there would be uh, reliving of birth as it happened. You, you can regress into a, a fetus, being, having a body of the fetus, but there would, all, there would be the same uh, emotions, the physical sensations uh, appropriate for the different stages of birth. But each of those matrices functions also as a selective gateway into, into what we now call transpersonal realm, okay? which uh, uh, has, as Jung described, two different dimensions. One is the uh, historical, where everything that has ever happened remains recorded. We have now a, a scientific model for that in Erwin Laszlo's Akashic field, the, the psi field, the subatomic, uh, you know, sub, sub quantum field, where everything that has ever happened remains uh, recorded. And the other aspect of the, of the collective unconscious is archetypal, where we can have experiences um, from any mythology that has ever existed, even if you don't know anything about it uh, intellectually. So this is the Jung's idea of the collective unconscious. So this is what you're, what you're going to see. And I would first go very quickly through birth and talk a little about the, the anatomy, the physiology, so that you see how logically the symbolic images are associated 
with the stages of birth. So the first matrix, the BPM1, is the fetus still in the womb. And of course there are differences in the quality of this uh, kind of situation. There could be um, pregnancy that was planned, wanted, uh, there's a decent marriage that's happening, the mother is healthy, in a good uh, emotional situation and so on. But that's not always so. This could also be a result of a rape. This could be a result of a one-night stand where both of these partners were drunk. This could be an unwanted child uh, where the mother attempted uh, unsuccessfully uh, abortion, either, either chemical or even mecha mechanical abortion. The mother could have been sick uh, and so on. The mother could have treated the child as an invader if it's an RH incompatibility. You have a RH positive child born to an RH negative mother. So we differ very much in the, the prenatal history. And this comes up in, in the work with holotropic states. It can take you back there and you would experience what your womb was like. Then um, this, if this is a good or bad womb come nine months, then uh, this starts changing, first hormonally, and then this is translated into actual mechanical contractions. Powerful, powerful contractions. They oscillate between, uh, between 50 and 100 pounds. And uh, so this, this is a force that sort of closes in on the, on the child. And in the second matrix, the second picture, the cervix is not open, so the child is in this no exit kind of a situation, very uncomfortable, where each contraction also cuts off the, the blood supply, which means no oxygen at that point, no nourishment, and no metabolic products are removed through the, through the placenta. But then as the, as the uterus contracts, it's kind of pulling the cervix over the head, it's dilating, as it is called, and uh, at a certain point it dilates, and then you shift to another stage, where still the contractions continue, the power of contractions. The head of the child is now wedged into the opening of the pelvis, which even under normal circumstances is extremely close to the uh, size of the head. So actually the head has to rotate and uh, you know flex and deflex de depending on the, on, uh, um, the position in the in the womb, very very to, to if you excuse the pun, very laborious kind of a struggle, laborious pilgrimage through this through this birth canal. Now here here you can have additional problems. I mean the the umbilical cord can be short, it can be twisted around the the neck, it it can get between the head and the and the side of the of uh, the birth canal, the, the worst thing there could be placenta previa. The, the placenta can actually close the the way out, and very effectively, the third matrix really is like the second matrix. It's a no exit situation. So the only way then is the cesarean section and so on. So th there is there is death in birth, you know, to different degrees depending how difficult, how difficult uh, birth is. There are children who die in the birth canal, have to be res resuscitated or die and are not resuscitated. Mothers can die. This is a life and death situation. And then um, there's another element which you need to understand the pictures. That choking and that pain generates a sexual type of an arousal. This is a this is energy that, if not identical with sexual energies, is very, very close. So this accounts for a variety of not so pleasant sexual images. You know, this is a um, source of all kinds of problems that we can have with, with sexuality. And this, the problem doesn't start after we are born. You know that Freud created a sensation when he said, uh, sex doesn't begin in puberty and then takes it all the way to the breast. This is even worse. I mean, we had our f first sexual type of experience when before we were even born. 
and and what makes sex so difficult is that is this happens in under very precarious circumstances you know you you cannot breathe you you are constricted you you in all kinds of pains you are inflicting pain on another organism another organism is inflicting pain on you there is blood there is uh, the amniotic fluid if there was no catheter there was no enema you can be born with that stuff there's a kind of a scatological stage a scatological encounter so here you have really the template for all the different conditions that Kraft Ebbing called psychopathia sexualis these deviations, sadomasochistic uh, experiences, bondage uh, syndrome, coprophilia, coprophagia, you know, all those. I don't want to go through the whole spectrum. And uh, then there is a situation where, of course, the, the fetus is born head first, feet first, it depends on the circumstances. And then the umbilical cord is cut either instantly or um, after it stops pulsating or somewhere in between. This depends on the philosophy of the obstetrician and also also circumstances. Okay. So this is the this is the power, this is the hero's journey that, that we have to go through. Now current psychiatry does not think this is a trauma. Okay which is bizarre, I, I, I can't connect to that thinking at all anymore. Because we, we agree in medicine, pediatricians agree, that the first moments between the newborn child and the mother are important. People like Marshall Klaus talk about bonding, the sort of the child and the mother looking at each other, it can determine the whole future relationship. In psychoanalysis you have the, the quality of the nursing, how that is important. Uh, um, Harris Tech Sullivan talked about the the child who is being nursed, uh, distinguishing the good nipple, the evil nipple, and the wrong nipple. Okay. The good nipple is a good is a nipple that gives you milk, and the circumstances are great. Uh, the evil nipple gives you milk, but the mother is unloving, anxious, uh, you know, sick, what rejecting, whatever. And then the wrong nipple is like your thumb or your big toe, you know. Um, you suck on it, doesn't even give you milk. And then he talks about all these consequences for future personality, but not taking into consideration birth. And then we have a lot of prenatal research, tomatis and so on, you know, showing an incredible sensitivity of the fetus in the womb. You play Vivaldi, you know, to pregnant mothers, and then you play it again in nursery, and the, the children will be doing much better, gaining more weight, sleeping better, and so on. So we have a situation that what, what psychiatry is telling us, the child doesn't notice anything when it's being born. Okay? Um, this could be you know, 14, 20, 30, 50 hours of a life-threatening situation. The child doesn't notice that anything happens. It's not recorded anywhere because the, the cortex is not myelinized. And then the child emerges as this instant connoisseur of nipple, nipples, you know. Mm, you know, circumstances are not quite right. Mom is not holding the right way. So if the child didn't notice that something strange was happening when it was being born, it's going to take a long, long time before it's going to respond to nuances of nursing. So obviously nursing is important, but, but the birth is paramount. I mean, it's a major, major event and so we will see some of the energies that it leaves in our leaves in our system the birth is also a situation where we disconnect from the transcendental realm and we sort of we are channeled into this into this samsaric uh, into this samsaric world okay so i first show you a story of one woman who was extraordinary uh, because of her artistic ability. This is Harriet uh, Francis, and uh, she published a book that you can buy, Drawing It Out. I wrote a preface, I did some uh, work with her before, uh, before writing that preface. So I will show you first this uh, kind of a synoptic view of those images, and then uh, show you one picture after another and say something about it.
yeah, we don't need the light now. From now on, it's going to be really, you know, right, right hemisphere, mostly. Okay, so this is a journey of one very talented, uh, very talented uh, artist who had no knowledge of Jungian psychology, no knowledge of shamanism. This, this whole thing came out of her psyche and it's a mixture of perinatal and transpersonal images, which means something coming from the levels of the psyche that are not recognized by current psychiatry other than being result of some strange pathology. If some, these, these things start happening to people, they get a diagnosis. Okay, so this is the first picture. What you notice, the upper part is are um, these geometrical ornaments. So if uh, you start experimenting with, with psychedelic substances and the dosages would stay within a certain uh, limit, a lot of the experience can be like this, abstract, beautiful abstract images. Uh, when we think about psychedelia, you know, we frequently Think about how people painted their car, the hippies painted their cars, wild colors, wild images. So when this was happening, people were saying it was incredible. It was like um, stained glass windows in the, in the cathedrals. It was like decoration in Muslim mosques, kaleidoscopic dynamic images and so on. Those of us who had these experiences, when we saw fractals, we said, this is it, we saw fractals. Fractals are computer-generated images, really graphic representation of uh, nonlinear equations. Everybody knows what fractals are? Uh, it's, a, it's like a beautiful, if you see it on the computer, beautiful complex ornament, and if you go to higher or lower mag magnifications, it uh, repeats, but with, with sort of variations. Uh, you can buy a video like Mandelbrot set or Julian set and so on. And it's related to the theory of chaos. So this kind of images would come when the normal organization of the psyche is kind of falling apart, but before you go really into your deep, deep unconscious. So it's like a border uh, that is there. Um, you can buy these, as I mentioned, the Mandelbrot and the Julian and some other, that my, some of my friends, you know, put it on, play some music. Uh, smoke a joint and remember the 60s. It's really like being in a, in a psychedelic experience. But it's getting heavier now. She feels oppression on her, on her chest and there's this anxious anticipation. And this is now the Newtonian Cartesian reality is kind of falling apart and as you can see she's not excited about it. She's trying to stop it and uh, in spite of what psychiatrists will tell you, there is no good way of stopping the psychedelic experience. The worst thing you can do is to give somebody tranquilizers in the middle of the bad trip, because you prevent the resolution and it freezes it there, and 10 years later you can find them still on tranquilizers, because when you take off the drug, the gestalt is trying to complete itself. So if somebody is on a bad trip, you hold their hand and say, you know, this, you are in a session, this is, this is going to end, I'm going to be here with you. And very frequently the worst trips become the most powerful uh, transformative experiences because it's not the LSD doing it to, to people, it's uh, your own psyche. You are now looking at a very difficult part of your psyche and if you can process it, you will be transformed. And she realizes that and she surrenders and the next thing you, you see, this is one of the ways this beginning of this uh, process happens. This is not just reliving birth, this becomes ultimately death, um, psych, uh, the process of psycho-spiritual death and rebirth. This will become a spiritual opening, not just a replay of the biology. So you, can, you will see the archetypes sort of playing into it. So now she is, she is in this gigantic vortex, whirlpool, that's pulling her in, and uh, the mandala made of uh, skulls and rib cages is telling you what this is about. She is now going to experience profound confrontation with death. Okay. 
And as I mentioned before, there is death in birth, okay? You, you read in philosophical books that people are afraid of death because we know we would die. That's not so. We, we already know what it is like to have our lives threatened because we, we have been there, we have experienced that. And don't, don't want to go back. It's like a, a difference between uh, uh, Christians and Christian mystics, you know. The Christians are afraid to go to hell and the mystics have been there and don't want to go back. <laughs> okay, now she is now in the underworld. You can think about uh, things like uh, Joseph Campbell's the, the Hero's Journey, Journey into the Underworld, or various mythologies, uh, Odysseus, uh, Orpheus, uh, Inanna, and so on. Those are, those are the mythologies that, that are being played out here. So she's in the underworld, the skulls, the, the bones, and she is now suffering. She is on a rack. She, there are ordeals. You can also think about the uh, initiatory journey of the shamans. This is like an initiation, shamanic initiation. The shaman travels novice shaman travels into the, uh, the underworld, is exposed to ordeal, you know, ends up uh, dismembered and then being put together, new, new blood, new eyes, and then there is a journey to the supernal realm. So this is very much what's happening to her. Um, there is a spider, which is a very kind of pitiful, pitiful specimen, so I will talk about, about them when we see some better examples. Now she is now in the underworld with a sense of kind of abysmal loneliness. This, this is happening on an archetypal level, but on the biological level it is now when the uterus contracts and cuts off any meaningful connection between the mother and the child. So when, when this kind of pattern starts emerging, this, this becomes a deep depression for the person, and the person feels like the fetus, feels cut off from any meaningful connections, like being surrounded by loving people and not feeling it, not having any connection, or being in a, in a crowd of people and feeling, feeling uh, alone. Now another, she just has amazing, amazing images, as you can see. Crushing, obviously, is part of the birth experience. So she is here under this gigantic boulder, and the boulder has human face. What a better, what a better representation of birth, which is coming from a human being, but has a mechanical, very mechanical quality. Uh, first, it was her husband, and she thought it was a metaphor that she is she she was in an oppressive marriage, and then it started. Uh, becoming more like her mother and then connecting to, to her childhood where the mother was crushing her and strangling her, not literally, but had this sort of con very constricting influence on her. And then she realized that there was one situation in her life where the mother was literally crushing her, which was when she was delivering her. And the psychedelic experiences come frequently in layers. I call it, call, call it coex system, systems of condensed experience. So you can almost feel another octave here where you have now Sisyphus in the underworld sort of rolling that heavy boulder and then he thought he had it and then he loses it and has to go for it again. Uh, and I like in the rhythm of the contractions, you know, you get a little breather and then, and then you, you, you go again. So uh, Sisyphus, uh, Hercules, the labors of Hercules. You have the scatological one, the, when he had to clean the stables of, uh, of Ogaius. He goes into the underworld for, for Kerberos and so on. So many of the labors of Hercules is, are archetypes that can, that can emerge around this. Again, another fantastic one. Now she confronted now uh, a situation where she is dying and being born at the same time. Okay, the lower part is all death, the upper part is birth. She's trying to get out of there. So showing the ambiguity. 
in our left hemisphere, we don't make connection between birth and death. You know, birth is at the beginning of life, it happens to a small child, death happens to old people, sick people. Uh, but the, in, in the psyche, in the unconscious, they are not inseparable. I mean, you can be dying and being born at the same time if you are in the process of psycho-spiritual uh, death rebirth. Another interesting one, here she got manual help from the obstetrician, but her experience is a demigod is rescuing her from the, from the underworld. And a classical shamanic sequence, sort of the, what we would call ego death rebirth, sort of. Uh, again, she didn't know anything about shamanism. This is annihilation, total annihilation and then the journey, the magic journey into the supernal world. Now, at this point, very frequently people connect with um, mythological uh, beings, you know, uh, heroes, gods, demigods, who represent in different cultures death and rebirth. So you have Isis, Osiris story, you have uh, uh, Dionysus uh, story, you have Atis, Adonis, uh, the Mayan twins, Quetzalcoatl, every major culture has that story. And many people from our culture at this point would identify with Jesus on the cross. And you know, we had that discussion. A lot of people think that because they experience themselves as Jesus, they are the second coming. And uh, current Christianity helps them because instead of telling them, you know, everybody is Jesus, uh, um, Jung talks about uh, Jesus as the symbol of the of the self. Those two aspects that we have. Uh, so the, the story that you hear that two thousand year, years ago this miracle happened when God got incarnate, and ever since that time we are miserable sinners waiting for the second coming. So people who have the experience of being Jesus, they think they are the second coming instead of realizing. Anybody can have that experience. It's there in the archetypal, in the archetypal world. So this could be any other um, sort of figure representing death rebirth from culture that, that you, you never heard about. Now this is a symbolic representation of it's over, the process, inner process is completed, and when you get stitches it's kind of closing, and then we see this thing, which is now, she's emerging out of the birth canal with the vision of a, of a peacock. A peacock, cross-culturally, is a symbol of uh, rebirth, resurrection, uh, immortality, symbolizes the star-filled sky. In alchemy, you have Kauda Pavon, is the peacock, peacock tail. This moment could be not just an encounter with your mother, but this could be, again, a higher octave. At this point, you could experience the great mother goddess. And several of the great mother goddesses have a peacock at their birth. You know, Hera, Juno, uh, Saraswati, and so on. And we'll see it later in the... In the